Uh, I know some of you are going to run out of time. Uh, so thanks for coming. This is kind of like a, uh, an added dimension to some of the craft futures we've been looking at in the last few sessions, which is this kind of relationship between 2D and 3D with a kind of fashion textile angle, but hopefully of interest to people well beyond that in terms of just thinking about space and manipulating space. Uh, so really uh, very pleased to, to have Julia Roberts with us, who's been uh, developing this um, subtractive cut and pattern for what, 10, 15, nearly 20, nearly 20, 20 years. years. Uh, and has been, this is the beginning of a world tour for this spring, you yeah, know, from yeah. every year I travel both far and wide uh, yeah. teaching it, so um, yeah, yeah, near the beginning, starts with the UK and then I stay in you'll yeah. see that when I, yeah, so Julian's going to do the, he can do his personal history, there's no point in me doing it, yeah. but anyway, thank you very much thanks and over to you. Cheers, first of all, thanks for inviting me, it's really nice to come back to Newcastle, even though it's in a very different venue from where I studied back in 94 when I graduated from my BA fashion uh, degree here. Um, I haven't been back in Newcastle for 12 years. I came back and teach, uh, taught a masterclass when I was uh, showing in London Fashion Week and uh, 12 years ago, so it's the first time I've been back in a while. It's really nice to return. I hope to keep returning. Um, I brought with me a garment which was constructed in the college uh, last week. Um, it was called the, Lib it's called the uh, Libby dress. And every garment I make is made for a particular person wherever I go in the world. And, um, it's constructed in one hour, very quickly. It's made from six holes. It's a, just a demonstration model that I do in different countries, and each of them is ever so slightly different, and it's a performance of cutting that people can observe and watch and see step by step. So what you're going to see is the uh, kind of opposite. It's the uh, reverse of that. I'm going to be taking this garment now, putting it on um, Laurel from... Um, uh, who's doing fashion and marketing, and uh, on the well, I'm then going to deconstruct it and dissect it and take it apart so you can see the inner geometry within it, and that will help explain how it was cut and constructed in a slightly faster way without me having to get on a sewing machine and sew it and make it. Um, of course, you're not seeing it step by step, so there'll be gaps in understanding of how it's made, but I do quite like having those gaps sometimes. You don't need to know everything. You just get to know the, the bare sort of bones of the idea and then you can perhaps fill in the gaps yourself in between. Or maybe you might mistakenly think that it's, uh, there's a step missing that you fill in and think happens that might actually improve the method or change it. I like the fact that subtraction cutting isn't just a static methodology of making, but it, it grows and changes wherever I take it, whoever picks it up and learns it. And um, it's always extending and changing and evolving um, over the 20 years I've been teaching it. So I'll start with a little video that just explains my background a bit more so you can kind of see where I came from and um, how I came to work in this particular way. Um, it starts with Spanish subtitles, um, which is, um, I work a lot in South America, in Central America and South America, in uh, Chile and Colombia and Argentina and, um, and uh, Mexico and uh, countries also like uh, Brazil where they speak Portuguese and as, as well as in uh, Spain itself and so um, a lot of my techniques get interpreted through people who um, take my language and, and uh, explain it to larger audiences and sometimes my cutting demonstrations are small groups and sometimes they're hundreds and hundreds of people and so you have to learn to talk through other people quite often when you're traveling around the world and um, Sometimes I go to places where there are interpreters and sometimes I go to places where there is no interpretation of language. So you have to dispense with language altogether and instead you do drawings and you do model making and you pick up material and you begin to show. And that's a very important form of communication where it's showing this making process and just to try and uh, allow people to sort of have an insight into it and understand it. My, my background is that I... When I was at school, I was very much into the sciences, into chemistry, and I was very into very early computer programming. And um, I then uh, sort of shocked my parents by not going to the science subject, but studying instead of BTEC National Diploma in women's wear design. And um, I, I sort of failed quite a lot of my exams when I was at school, 
and I wasn't hugely, um, I didn't ever think of myself as being hugely academic, um, particularly maths I'd fail. And then when I first started learning garment making, it was very numerical and very uh, nu heavily numbers based and very symmetrical. And there's lots of rules within it that are, can sometimes put off people or elude them into thinking that it's a very complicated subject. Um, but slowly over time, I kind of, at first I didn't think I was very good at pattern cutting and I wouldn't be very good at um, garment making because I didn't understand this sort of logic of, of uh, construction that I was being taught. Uh, but in time, and actually through different teachers I met, um, both here in Newcastle and uh, later on uh, when I did my master's degree at the Royal College of Art, I began to sort of meet and understand different ways of work, uh, different sort of experts and who had certain idiosyncrasies and ways of working that were just very intriguing and very human and, uh, and quite some often quite humorous. Uh, and that just really changed my approach to garment making and allowed me to um, make mistakes, allow errors to be made, uh, through those error, errors to um, uh, sort of learn that sometimes undeliberate things are very intriguing and, and feed you and give you lots of ideas. So subtraction cutting um, developed as a, um, it was given this name really, subtraction cutting, because a lot of the time I was, I was um, cutting space into, cl into flat cloth and removing space and that space uh, that I was removing, this negative space, was the space that the body occupied, that people would get into or move through. And so the word subtraction cutting stuck at that point to the technique. But it was never designed as a technique that was just about cutting of holes and subtracting. It was really just a methodology that I developed slowly over time that involved lots of risk taking and mistakes and a strange approach to pattern cutting and making. There was a little bit mixed up and a little bit, a little bit wrong and, uh, and incorrect in the way it went about. To, uh, sort of uh, trying things out and playing with pattern cutting rules, and it just became my way of cutting, my my approach to garment making, and that was through flat patterns. It was designing through flat patterns and not quite knowing what the outcome might be. It was a, a bit of a jump into the unknown, a risk, and I always loved that way of working, of not knowing the design until you have been through the process of making and you find it, you discover it. The design comes last, not first. Because that was the exact opposite of how we were ever taught how to design garments and how the industry often operates in fashion. Often you start with a garment drawing, an illustration on a person, and that illustration dominates the design process. And design is often seen as these people who do these wonderful drawings and then pass them to teams of talented cutters and makers who interpret it and create it and uh, allow their vision to be seen. But I always found that way of working a very sort of um, historic and um, sort of uh, outdated met method of making garments that didn't really honour the craft of making, the craft of cutting and sewing and touching the soft material, flexible materials. And um, I didn't like this idea that you had to know the design first and that you would uh, then everything was set in stone almost from then on through the construction and making process to try and realise this drawing that you'd made, this design. I felt that was quite a sort of uh, a limiting process that if you're doing drawing, surely you're thinking of something you've seen before, something historic, something you're influenced by. So um, a lot of your work is going to be based upon other people's work. And I felt that there were shapes and forms that could be created that had never before been created. And, and if you just simply let go of the initial design and just follow the process of making and construction, perhaps you might, through error, risk, and um, just perseverance, discover something really, really intriguing and allow the design to actually just happen in time for it to just dawn upon you later down the line. And so that really is what subtraction cutting is. It's a, it's a process of designing that doesn't have a design at the start and it's the process of cutting and construction that, that methodology that draws the design out at the end of it all. Here we have a bit of sort of a mixture of two videos sort of uh, mishmashed together and I like to sort of show lots of visuals that have um, um, uh, showing more than one thing at a time. Um, it, there's a Japanese video playing on top of another video that's about a website. The website's called Wednesday Website, which I talk about in a set. <coughs> the Japanese side of it really started here at Newcastle. When I was in my second year of my degree, I started making films and I started making films to document the work I made and to talk about it, mainly to get over my fear of public speaking and 
my fear of having to stand up in front of my peers at crits and talk about my work when you project video, then the heat is off you and everyone's looking at the screen and it has its own timeline and it's unlike a slideshow that you have to progress with by pressing a button and saying something in between. Video just runs on its own with its own music and content and it shows process and movement, lots of physical things that I believe garment making is all about. And um, so filmmaking became a very important part of talking about garments while I was here, but I was also very influenced by Japanese fashion designers whilst studying here, um, and particularly the work of Izzy Miyake and Comme de Garçon and Yoji Emoto, big sort of uh, incredible avant-garde um, Japanese designers. And uh, there was a big exhibition in London uh, called Future Beauty, 30 Years of Japanese Fashion Design, which is at the Barbican Gallery, and I was asked to give a live cutting demonstration in front of 180 people there. And, I decided to go back to my old college and um, to scan the books uh, that I'd once read back up here uh, that showed some of the work of the people who'd most influenced me. And the reason these people influenced me were because they were making garments that were asymmetrical, that had space within them, that were often quite large. Some of them inflated huge with air inside it uh, into more architectural realms um, of space, uh, beyond, way beyond the body. And this just really, as a student in my second year of my degree, opened a door to think that actually garments can, uh, they can get beyond this mannequin shape we have here, which is symmetrical left to right, which doesn't have arms and doesn't have a head, doesn't have legs or pinions or move, and can actually perhaps, the patterns can get into much larger spaces that are perhaps uh, more architectural in scale. So. Um, I decided to make this sort of Japanese video as a background piece for me to cut against and that's been playing and comes in and out a little bit during the process of this little slideshow showing now as well as another video called Wednesday website and Wednesday website is just really lots and lots of inspiration lots of things that catch my eye and it's put together at a time when um, it's a bit like a tumbler of, of um, sort of a, a, a mental stream of uh, visual consciousness of things that you're looking at and homing in on which designers have to do all the time. They have to be like a sponge absorbing all this visual inspiration. And um, I created this website that um, would have all this inspiration that I was looking at in real time each week to create collections to show uh, at London Fashion Week. And um, I wanted that process to, to be transparent so that people could see it. But I didn't want people to see it all the time. I wanted to try and focus my audience attention more. So I made a website that read people's computer clock and on their computer. And if it wasn't a Wednesday, and it wasn't between the hours of 10 in the morning and 8 in the evening, a sign would come up saying closed. So you could only access it one day of the week between the hours of 10 in the morning and 8 in the evening on a Wednesday. And that was called Wednesday Website. And it was a project that just allowed me to expose my uh, research and my working methodology to an audience that um, had to set an alarm clock to view, to view it. And that was very important because we live in this time of social networking where uh, everything is available all the time, uh, that you can... Uh, make the experience of what you see personalised to you, um, that you can love heart, pin, thumb and like things and have followers and often that gives you a very false impression of who your fans are, who the people are who really understand your work and appreciate it. And so rather than bow to that, I wanted to really try and limit who sees my work to just one day a week between certain hours. And that infuriates some people but in time it allowed me to get closer to knowing and meeting and understanding the audience of people who were beginning to follow my work as a designer. And uh, in time, it, people would get in touch and they would uh, talk to me about it and they would invite me to come and um, see their colleges and talk to their students or to their design teams or wherever they, they were. After doing my degree here at Newcastle, I went and did a um, a master's degree at the Royal College where I learned uh, menswear tailoring. I did a menswear uh, uh, master's degree, which was quite different to the women's wear, quite slightly more colder constructed garments, which are often numerically measured and based and lined and the geometry is cut into paper. I learned instead by watching very skillful tailors at work who were often quite elderly. Um, there was one particular called John Polaris who was 82 when he came into the college to show us how to make a suit and a, a tailored uh, single-breasted jacket. And um, it was just really fascinating 
watching somebody who was so experienced and who all of their life had been making garments, who didn't use uh, patterns and rulers and uh, the methodologies of normal garment making that I'd learned to that point, but who simply got chalk and would look at a person, look to see what their stance was, how their pose was, and just look at them and then just chalk onto the cloth from memory and from experience what line they thought was needed. And then to cut with their scissors, not the line that they just chalked, but instead a different line, a line that they thought was actually the correct line. So there were certain lines of construction and certain line cutting lines of experience that they knew was the right line. And it was very difficult to understand why they do that, because obviously they've been doing it for a very, very long time. But it was just, I began to understand that there's a very human connection to making of garments, and, and I wanted to try and absorb that as much as I can. It certainly influenced my cutting a great deal. I love the fact that when tailors were working, they were taking a scissor and they were putting it into the back of their hair to lubricate the blades from their oil from their hair. And if you ever want to see a sort of true tailor, they might have a little ball patch with an ear missing from <laughs> years of lubricating their shears in their hair. They would then take a sleeve head or a, or a collar, a rear collar roll, which rolls back on itself, and they bend it over their hands, and they use the moisture of their hands and a little bit of saliva, and they stitch it. A lot of hand working to make this roll perfect on sleeve heads and on collars, and lots of stitching internally to make this structure that you don't normally see that holds the garment in place. And by the end of the process of hand stitching putting this garment together, the garment looked as if it hadn't been touched by human hands. It was perfect in every way. And I love this idea that something so perfect could be made through so much human connection to the material, so much warmth from the hand. And that inspired me a great deal. And um, after leaving the Royal College, I worked for a few years for a designer, Jasper Conran, as, a, um, as an assistant in a very, very stressful, hard-working environment, which is often the case in fashion design. Fashion designs often beast their employers uh, to... Uh, produce work, working round the clock, very late into the evening. It's very stressful, there's lots of shouting and screaming, there's people crying and lots of emotions, and um, it's a kind of quite a harsh atmosphere to someone that's working. But I, what I learned from this experience really was I, I witnessed a designer who doesn't actually cut and construct and sew and make. It was a designer who would do a drawing that was quite poor and then give it to an illustrator who's fantastic, who would interpret it in a better way, and then pass it down the line to a um, cutter and maker, who was exceptionally skillful, who would put it together and realise this, uh, this vision. And this often is the way it works through the design process in fashion design. The designer is often disconnected from the making process and not really attached to it. Their hands don't touch the cloth, the warmth of their hands. And for me, touching cloth is proof of love. It's what makes the garment. It's very important to me that I maintain that relationship with the material itself, which is very different to paper, cardboard, or any of the sort of rigid geometry we learn from an early age. It's, it's, it can't be controlled in the same way. Gravity um, is always sort of working against it. Every fabric is different. You have to learn it, you have to understand it. And it comes to the hands, it comes to touching, that you really begin to understand its weight, its tactility, and how it moves. And that's a very important thing that, learning from a tailor, I began to understand how I wanted to operate as a designer when I put my collections together, uh, working in place in a sort of commercial environment like London Fashion Week. So I learned how really not, by this experience of working at Jasper Connors, I really learned how not to be a designer and how I might be a designer differently, working with a team where I'm involved very much so in the construction process and that I collaborate with other makers. I only really wanted makers around me, rather than um, calling myself a designer and just having this paper trail that led eventually through the workroom to these skillful makers who realised the work. So I, I left Jasper Connor and I set up a label called Nothing Nothing and it was my first label that launched in the spring summer 00, <coughs> the new tone of the millennium. And um, these are collections that are showing now, there's, all, there's various ones, some were shown on catwalks which is a very sort of typical way of uh, explaining and showing garments to people. Um, some were shown through video, some were projected onto buildings, some were performances of making. For example, coming up in the set, there's a collection called the Red Dress Collection, and the Red Dress Collection was trying to, um, trying to reduce the time between designing and making and showing to the shortest possible time frame. Usually designers will 
hone and create their collection over a season, now less so because they don't, they're working, moving away from working in seasons, but they have time to make the collection, to perfect it, to prototype it, to get it absolutely right. And only then do they show it to their critical audience of buyers and press who observe it, who critique it, who sell it. And I wanted to shorten that distance as much as possible. So instead of having a collection finished, I invited an audience of very important press and buyers during London Fashion Week to come and see my collection, uh, but I hadn't actually made it yet. I just had fabric. And so in three hours, I cut a collection of 10 pieces uh, for them to witness. And what was most important about that for me was that it was putting what was most important to me in front of these, these people who were describing fashion, talking about fashion, communicating it to the wider world. And a lot of times when people are writing about fashion designers, they, editors and writers will call a designer a genius cutter or a genius maker, when really they don't know what that means. And often the, it wasn't actually the designer themselves that cuts it, it was somebody else who doesn't get the thanks and praise and doesn't, have the, uh, doesn't take the bow at the end of the catwalk, who is invisible, who's uh, hidden from view. Um, in, in French, they call it le petit mans, uh, the, the atelier, the people who make the clothes are called the little hands of the designer. But often they're the invisible hands that aren't seen and it's very rare to actually uh, see that part exposed. Uh, unlike in a, a big movie that's made by Hollywood or any sort of TV production, you get a long list of everyone that's worked on that production at the end of the credits. That doesn't really happen in fashion design. It's always the designer who takes the bow on behalf of their team. But that unfortunately miseducates a lot of people who buy uh, garments, who, uh, who write about them, who celebrate it, because they don't really understand the process of how it was created. And so with the Red Dress collection, what I wanted to do was to show them, to, to expose it, and to show how easy it is. It's not complicated. It's just simply a question of drawing some lines, cutting some holes, connecting them together, and now you know how it's made. And if you want, you can buy that garment, or if you want, you can go away and make it yourself. I don't really mind. It's up to you. Um, I wasn't obviously a, a very good capitalist in selling my work. So I don't, that sort of, uh, those kind of ways of working make you rich. But they do... It most importantly, put what's most important to you in front of your audience and you're educating them. If you're a designer, you have to be a teacher. You have to be explaining to your audience how something is made, how it's constructed, what's important about it, what makes it different from everything else that's out there. You have to be going to factories and to working with uh, other skilled makers and you need to communicate with a comparable language of understanding. And so all of it is about teaching. And it's always very important, I think, that people understand that, that teaching is something you have to do if ever you make something and you want it to be realized, particularly in such a challenging material as textiles, which is so flexible, which is often like more like a liquid than a solid, that um, operates in ways that you can't necessarily foresee when you're constructing it and designing it. So during the process of showing at Fashion Week, I had 12 seasons showing during at London Fashion Week, which is a big sort of showcase event um, that draws a huge international crowd, puts a lot of media attention upon you, lots of TV cameras and lots of uh, people asking lots of sort of bizarre questions in interviews and you get called certain things uh, like you're the new Hussein Shalane or something like that or the new Adam McQueen. Uh, you always have to follow in the footstep of whoever was there before. And I felt after receiving this media attention, receiving certain awards from the British Fashion Council that my audience was writing about me in a way I didn't really understand. I didn't recognize what they were saying. So I decided to kill my label, which was called Nothing Nothing, and I put it on eBay for one pound with all of my um, patterns, hundreds of them, my trademark, my website, um, on a day called Buy Nothing Day, an anti-capitalist day, where you could just simply have it for a pound, and it just went. And it allowed me to, to get rid of the patterns that I relied upon to make the next collections. Usually when people make garments, they make basic shapes. And those basic shape patterns are then the form that is used to make the next collection, then the next collection. And you can often look at a designer's work by sort of understanding the core shape, that they're, the core patterns that they're using to make every collection, which are then adapted. When you get rid of those patterns, when you give them away or sell them, then it forces you to have to find new ones. And so I set up a new label called Julian Ands. Julian Ann's question mark. It's sort of, I wanted to collaborate with somebody, but I didn't know who. So I like this idea of there being an unknown audience out there that perhaps I could reach out to, that I could begin to collaborate with. And so this is really an idea that continues to this day. And really, I 
feel that my teaching is part of too. I go and I often do big making sessions with students who then respond in the afternoon by making a garment themselves. And in one day, we make 40 outfits, which everyone's able to see and witness together and feel connected to. Um, and they can see all the different variations on the theme of making. And I feel then that we've collaborated, that something's been passed on to them. And then they can take it in whatever direction they then want to go in and adapt it and change it and make it their own, and that it can be free in that way. Um, back in 2001, I decided to put my techniques of making online so that people could actually try them out if they wanted to. But that, at that time, I didn't really know what online was. I didn't really know where does this internet begin and end, and who is the other side of it exactly. So by putting ideas out there and disseminating it and sharing it at an early stage, it was very interesting to then have a response slowly from people around different corners of the world who had seen it, who had thought about it, who had it become part of their work, and that then who had perhaps become teachers or design heads of departments and design companies who would then invite me to go and talk to their teams or to their uh, students. And it started a sort of a very nomadic lifestyle where I had been drawn more into teaching. I'd set up a new fashion course at the University of Hertfordshire and become a professor there. And I then decided that with this very heavy title professor that, uh, and this expectation that I had to work with just one institution, that I really needed to escape this and to get out into the world. And so I, I resigned and went on this very large nomadic journey, traveling around 40 universities in the UK and then now 30 countries in the world teaching subtraction cutting. And it doesn't end, it just continues. I don't really advertise it much other than to show the work we make and the performances I do. And then people get in touch and then invite me to go out and see their work. And because I now teach it to teachers and to make, um, people who uh, instruct others, there are now different forms of subtraction cutting taught in different places, which I don't have control of. It's, uh, it's something that's bigger than yourself. And it's something fascinating to witness and very much something that teaches me how a methodology can just grow and transform through the involvement of other people, through shared ownership. In fashion design, people are very territorial with their work. They don't like to share ideas. They, they think this is my design and I have to patent it and I, have a, um, I don't want to lose any value by other people understanding how it's made. But that's a very sort of limited way of thinking that doesn't allow user participation. It doesn't allow it to grow beyond their own understanding of what that idea might be. Unlike dancers who get together and collaborate on movements to form a piece, dance piece, or musicians who jam together to make music, um, fashion designers don't share often in that way and actually by sharing things you, you discover very fascinating things about the process and uh, see how uh, diverse it can possibly be and, and it just keeps growing. So I, at the moment I teach a series of different techniques that I uh, show to people and then let them run right with them and do what they want. But the first technique is called tunnel technique and if you do download the book, the free cutting book off my website then it will always be the first chapter. And, um, it's, it's what this garment is made from and all these garments and pieces I'm going to show you. It's essentially, it's called tunnel technique because it's made from a tube. And a tube is really a very simple shape. Uh, a tube is hollow and you get into it and you might put an arm through it, you might put a leg through it, you might bring your head through it, or you might put your body through it. But basically all garments are essentially tubes. There's nothing really more to it than that. Uh, you can make it seem more complex but it really isn't. And if you can understand what to do with a tube, then you can understand what to do with a dress, to a skirt, to a sleeve, to a collar, to, to men's wear, to women's wear, and you can understand the whole process if you can just see what you can do with a, a uh, tube-like pattern. I'm just going to pause this just for one set because the video that was um, showing a minute ago, I was deconstructing a garment on a um, person called Timo. He was lying on the floor, and uh, Timo is a rather tall person, and the reason I was drawing onto Timo um, is that one of the lovely things about um, collaborating and sharing ideas is that they get picked up by interesting people. And Timo Rissonen is a professor of sustainable fashion at Parsons in New York. He's just become a dean. And he um, was studying his PhD at uh, uh, UTS Sydney uh, out in Australia. And he had received over the internet these techniques I'd put online and he connected it to another... Uh, cutter based in New Zealand called Holly McQuillan. Uh, now, between the two of them, Holly and Timo, uh, work in an area called zero waste cutting. And zero waste cutting, the sort of the principles of it are that when you make a garment, this is the back and this is the front, it goes together to sandwich into a garment. When you have these pieces and you cut them from a layer fabric, 
there's often spaces between them, in between the negatives, which are wasted, which get uh, thrown away. You can, you can connect things a little bit more economically, but there's always going to be some wastage in between. And that wastage, if you're making one garment, isn't a lot. If you're making um, a thousand of them, it's a lot more. And obviously certain garments like t-shirts, jeans and hoodies, which are made in their millions, have phenomenal volumes of waste. So Holly and Tim are working in an area of zero waste design where they try to minimise that waste down to almost nothing. A bit like a jigsaw puzzle, when you have a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle put together, there are no gaps. And so they try to design intelligently shaped garments and intelligently shaped debris that is useful in some way and can be incorporated into either the garment being made or into another garment that's being made so there's no material waste. And this is to try and inspire the industry to be a hell of a lot less wasteful than it is currently being. So Holly, who is based in New Zealand, invited Tim and myself to come and collaborate in, in uh, Wellington at Massey University. And we travelled from London, Tim and myself together, but Timo's luggage got left behind in London, and so we arrived the other side of the world, and he didn't have anything to wear. So I said to him, oh, you can just wear my clothes. But he then looks at me and sort of says, he's like this tall bloke, he's looking at me, he's like, short ass, yeah, I'm not going to fit into your clothes. And I didn't really consider this difference in size between us. So I thought, okay, we have to start collaborating, making garments together. That's our reason for being in New Zealand. And the reason was to, to, to waste less material and to take risks. And, but when you start working with somebody that you've never worked with before, it's often difficult to know where to begin. So it's often good to identify a problem. What is the problem in hand that can be solved? And if there isn't a problem, maybe invent a problem to solve. So the problem at this point was that Timo didn't have anything to wear, so let's make him something to wear. That's a nice starting point to start a collaboration off. So I decided I'm going to make a garment for Timo, but as, he, as I just realised he's bigger than me, I'm going to try and get a measure of his size. So I decided to lay him on the ground and draw around him, which is the video you've been seeing, and this is the pattern that was then formed, which allowed me as a reference point to understand his scale. It's a very useful thing when understanding the scale of human beings. From that, I was then able to make this shaped ruler. When we learn pattern cutting, anyone that's studied pattern cutting, they're often armed with tools that resemble this or triangles, and this particular one is called a pattern master, which is a very grand title for a piece of plastic, really. I don't really know what half the lines and holes and curves on this particular contraption are for. Some people might use it to make an armhole or a, maybe a neckline or something like that, but I don't really understand why somebody would need a curve to follow when they've got their wrist or their arm, which has natural curves within it. Um, but it's, I like it as a handle to hold on to, it's quite a nice thing if I'm drawing a straight line sometimes, sometimes useful for doing measured things. But for Timo doesn't come in centimetre or millimetre measurements, he comes in his own units of measurements, and also he's asymmetrical, as all people are, because all people are obviously made from a series of curves and their symmetries, there are, is no straight line in the human body. Uh, everyone's always moving, changing, they're dynamic, they're breathing, their body isn't static, it's always on the, on the go. And often they're not standing up like a mannequin is like this, they're sitting down doing other things. And so I wanted to get an understanding of Timo's body shape in order to make a garment for him, but I thought I'd start, rather than by making a t-shirt or a, a jean or a particular garment type, I'd just make a sleeve. By making a sleeve, it's nice and open-ended, it might grow into a shirt or a jacket, I don't know yet, but it means I don't have to have all the ideas at the beginning. Let's start with just a little problem, solve that, and then figure out where it goes. So I decided if I'm going to make a sleeve for Timo, I need therefore a ruler in the shape of his arm. That's a nice starting point, because I can then wrap it around his wrist or his elbow and start to make measured points on it, that instead of being centimetres are measurements that relate to his wrist, his uh, I don't know, his elbow to shoulder measurements that are human. I like to make tools, it's a nice thing to, as a starting point. And then from there I made a sleeve for Timo to wear and at the time the only clothes he had was a Qantas t-shirt that the airliner gave him and a pair of Qantas pants. And here's Holly on the outside beginning to get involved in the collaboration, we're beginning to sort of work together. This is only a sort of a simple idea this sleeve, but it's based on a very simple tube and a series of holes that connect together. From that, Holly takes it and grows it into a coat jacket, and it's quite an interesting shape. It doesn't have any waste materials in it. If I'm throwing a piece of fabric on the floor that I'm discarding, we were each picking it up and cannibalizing each other's waste and using it and finding a purpose for it. So it became an interesting collaboration. But during this process, Timo got bored watching us doing this work, and so he took the sleeve and he turned it upside down and he put it on his leg. 
And when I saw it on his leg, I thought, hold it, that's much nicer as a, on your leg than on a sleeve. So let's forget about sleeves. Now we're making trousers. Trousers uh, uh, suit the purpose of this particular shape more. It offer, also connects to a sculpture that it reminds me of by Umberto Boccioni, who in 1914 did this very dynamic sculpture that has this feeling of dynamics and movement sort of built within it. And this very much related to this idea of a garment shape that a trouser leg is a dynamic tube. Your trousers, very, your legs very rarely keep completely still. They're always moving, bending, in move, you know, doing stuff. So I like the idea that the tube that you create for a trouser leg has some of that sort of inbuilt dynamics or uh, the aesthetic of dynamics uh, within it uh, as part of its design. Once the um, trouser had been kind of put together and made, which was this one here, I then cut, I then end up with a trouser pattern that looks like this. Now this trouser pattern, for anyone that doesn't make garments, or even those who do, doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. It's a pattern that's actually laying down on its side. When we make patterns, we often orientate them to stand up for it. So we hang garments on hangers, so they look like this, and often we hang them with the front facing towards whoever's viewing them. Uh, we often put a lot of emphasis on the front. And when we're constructing the patterns as, as garment makers, we often will have it facing towards ourselves like this, as if it's standing upright with a bottom and a top. And that's very conventional in the making of garment design. Uh, sometimes people work on digital computers to make garments, and because of the fact that a digital environment is a landscape environment, because of the way that the screen that uh, computers were based on uh, is laid out, people sometimes lay their patterns sideways instead. And I often witness people working on digital pattern cutting, but they're doing this with their necks. Because they're trying to turn it upright, because there's a convention that we need to, in our mind, understand the garment like it stands up. Yeah. But um, if you were to see a house, it stands on the ground like this, with windows upstairs and the chimney here. This orientation of a house is what I would call a uh, frontal view of a house. Because you can only see the front, you can't see the side or the back or any other view on it. Um, it's also an elevated view because it stands on a ground with a bottom and a top in an upright direction, a bit like a person uh, who might be viewed like this, standing upright. Fashion designers, when they do sketches and designs, they'll always do upright drawings of people. It's just the way they all learn or think they have to do it. And often they do the front view first. And often with students who are studying fashion design, they'll, if you say, if you give them a deadline, like, I want you to give me 100 designs by tomorrow, they'll say, do we have to do back views? It would be a question that would crop up. Because people think, well, the, what's most essential is we get the front views, and then we backfill and do the back views, side views. But of course, the only reason to ever draw a design is to explain its construction and make and what it is as a three-dimensional object. So of course you have to design every angle on that necessary to explain that process. Or maybe just dispense with the drawing altogether, just get making, get constructing in 3D straight away. But it's a convention that runs through fashion that we look at this viewpoint, and I like to call it a worm's eye view of the world. It's worm's eye because we're looking <coughs> at this piece of work, a bit like in a catwalk show, we have a um, raised platform that we put on either side, at VIP audiences, front rows on either side, divided a bit like a wedding between bride and groom, but between press and buyers. But actually the most important people are inhumanely piled up on top of each other here at the end of the catwalk, and that's the photographers. who are in a very close, tight focal viewpoint so that they can see the front view. And when the models are going down the catwalk, I'm often videoing here, so I notice that the cameras go crazy. They go chick -chick 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 like crazy. There's a big sort of like whirlwind of activity. And then when the model turns, the cameras go quiet because the money shot the, is a front view. And if you ever look at the sum up of the seasons of all the different fashion designs who show around the world, from London, Paris, Milan, Tokyo, New York, all the student shows, you will see in Vogue and Elle and Collezioni just front views, front views, front views, front views endlessly, as if no other view exists. But of course, we're humans and we are not just front views. We're not just making aprons. We're making things go around the body. So we need to develop a way of a geometry, a way of dealing with the body that is far more human, far more three-dimensional, rather than this approach to design which favours only the front view in the design process, the construction process, because when we construct patterns, we often do the front first, and then we'll do the back. It seems to always come first for some reason. And we merchandise them in shops with the fronts facing forwards, and then shop windows often with the front forward, and fashion magazines, the front uh, viewpoints. It's very, very dominant. 
So any dominance in design, I need to question. It's, uh, that's the role of any designer, is to question why these conventions are there and are there other ways of approaching them. So the way I like to approach a pattern is a little bit more from a, uh, what I might call an aerial viewpoint. So this is the house, like this, from above. And that's the chimney. And I call this a bird's eye view. So we've got worm's eye view and we've got bird's eye views. And this viewpoint was really used, not that frequently in fashion design, it was used to make kimonos, for example, in Southeast Asia. And it's also used in South America to make ponchos, where we start with a hole. And that hole is big enough for your head to get through. And then you put another circle around it, and suddenly we've got a fabric that falls around the body like a poncho does. We do use it also to make a circular skirt, a hole big enough to step through, and the distance of its length being that long. But it's a nice aerial viewpoint. And subtraction cutting, the tunnel technique, which I'm showing you, mixes these two views together. So we're not just seeing it from just one angle, but that maybe that, that within the pattern itself, there's a movement of geometry and a fluidity to it that isn't rigid. Because when we learn geometry at schools, particularly here in the UK, uh, we learn to put a hard square peg into a square hole and a triangle peg into a triangle hole. And these are rigid shapes, and we learn very strict, measured, ruled geometry. But that is fine for maybe stiff, hard materials that architects might use or product designers, such as stone and glass and uh, steel. But as garment makers, we're not using those materials. We're using something far more fluid and um, harder to control that needs a different kind of geometry. And so we need to change the way that we go about constructing and making it. Uh, so the tunnel technique bends geometry quite a lot, and I'll be showing you how that's done. But first of all, I think maybe a good idea would be to cut it off the body. Just before I do, when this pattern, which is lying on its side here, um, it has, if anyone's made a garment pattern before, they may hone in on one view thing that they might recognise, and that is a dart. A dart is a little tiny triangle of space that when you sew it close and remove it, you subtract it, it creates a contour, which in this instance is for the bum. So it's a, this is a bit like, sorry, this way around, goes here. This is a one piece trouser, a one piece pattern for a trouser. You stitch down one seam and then you'd have another leg here and you've got this triangle a bit that what it does is by being removed, it creates a contour for the bum. And that's what that is there. This here is the top of a trouser, which kind of relates to a shape that's similar to this. Apart from this, the mirror opposite of this, to the dance here. Yeah, and this curve here is the seam that goes under the legs. There's then a series of holes. And these holes are what I call tunnels. They connect together. They're paired. And by being sewn together, they create roots through the garment. And when I cut the garment apart, so that you're going to see this dress, it has the same geometry. It has a series of holes, and those holes are circular in this example. They don't have to be circular. They can be any shape you want them to be, as long as you're big enough to get through it. As long as the leg is big enough to get through it, or the arm, or the head, or the body, depending on what you're designing. And so this is their big enough legs. In this example, they'd be big enough for hips or torsos to go through. I'll cut it past the seat. Left and right leg. The circles that were removed were then used by Hollies to make collars. So this is a zero waste approach where <coughs> we are cannibalizing each other's waste and using it. Then there's a real series of fitting, constructing it, getting it right before eventually Timo has a pair of trousers that he can wear. And it was quite a nice, nice sort of unique. By that point, we'd begun the collaboration and we want to roll and we're starting to sort of like uh, share ideas. I will take this off and I'm going to put it onto Laurel, who's very kindly agreed to wear it. Because rather than make things for mannequins, which don't have arms and legs and the ability to move, it's much nicer to see it on a dynamic human being. This garment was made for a girl called Libby in her body shape. So the body shapes will be slightly different, but I know this will fit you. And what is nice is that now this garment is also, of course, uh, the well. Everything gets signed and dated as to who makes it. Every, every garment has a character, and so it's very important that um, that character is remembered. Because eventually, when I take this garment apart, I'm then eventually going to mend it again, and it will come back to life, and it will be a Libby Noel dress. There you go. I'm going to put this above your head. Okay. You can put your hands in the air, like that, okay, and then I can put it down. It might stick to your clothes because cloth sticks to cloth quite well. So I'm just going to leave that like 
Just give me a turn around. Cool. Before I take it apart, because I'm not going to see it after I take it apart and I put it back together, I need to take a quick picture of it just to remember it. So I'm going to ask you to give me exactly that and then a side view that way. Cool. And then a back view. And then a, the other side. Amazing. Cool, now I know what it looks like. So also, another thing I'm just going to very quickly do is I'm going to just video the process of this being deconstructed, but I'm going to do it in a sort of like a um, speeded up version of it. So I'm going to um, put a little camera somewhere that will watch this being taken apart. Maybe I'll put it there as a start. So if you just give me a turn around as a start, I might put some lights up. Yeah. Keep turning, just as if you were sort of like just spinning very slowly. So you can see this 360 degrees. I'm going to explain a few things about it, just so that you understand it. For start, there's a seam on the front here. And if you follow that seam around, eventually it ends up on the back. So a seam that is both on the front and the back suggests a hole. And that if, and that the body is actually standing in it, so that the seam continues from front round to back. So you're in fact standing in a hole. That hole is a little bit like this. Um, when you cut a hole, this hole is 100 centimetres in size. Um, just for, for no apparent reason, it's a rounded up number, but it's a, it's a number that I know I can get to. Uh, when you cut two of them into a rectangle like this, and you leave between them a fold, that's called a valley fold, so it's like when you close a book together, it creates a V. They're sewn together and they're connected. And if I was to step through that hole, then what we're seeing here is a seam that's on the front, but which continues around here through the valley fold to the back. And that's what's happening here, it's starting on the front and it's continuing around to the back. Often when people construct and make these garments, they'll say, where are the holes? Because they're often wearing the garment, and I'm like, you're in the holes. Um, it's quite strange for people to understand where these holes end up <coughs> in. Um, if I'm making it for a dancer, or if I'm making it for somebody, usually I measure the hole depending on the largest part around the person. Never tight measurements, always easy measurements. You always need to make garments that allow for room of movement within them. And if I was making it for a dancer, then I would take a measurement that might be a kick stride measurement above their head. So you're building into the garment the ability to do that movement. If I'm working in stretch materials, I might make holes that are smaller than the body, but which have the ability to stretch so that they cling on. So you can make freedom of movement or you can suppress freedom of movement. It depends. I sometimes work with, say, Nike, for example, the design company, to do dynamic sportswear. And for that, we use much smaller holes, tighter materials, and therefore we end up with garments that sort of hug onto the body a lot closer. With this, there's volume and there's, sh there's room and there's space. Um, now between the valley fold, as the two holes come together, it creates what I call um, a sort of secondary tunnel. And you may, if you were to come over here, see certain areas of this dress, we think, oh, it's like a pocket. If you were to put anything into it, like say a purse or a wallet or a phone, you'd end up losing it because it actually continues through over here. So it's no good for anything valuable, but it's quite good for a sword or an umbrella or something like that, if you're worth enough to be carrying one of them around with you. Um, what that is, is when the holes connect together and it creates a valley fold between it, it creates a tunnel on the outside of the garment. And uh, it's, it's a bit like a sort of little wormhole that go, starts in one part of space and ends up in another part of space. So it has some sort of uh, vague scientific reference to my sort of uh, inspiration. Um, Another thing is, is there's another hole, if you turn to the back here, which is here. Now this hole starts on the back, and it continues through a valley fold tunnel, and it comes out over here somewhere. And, but that's on the back, and it's staying on the back. So the body isn't passing through this particular hole. It's only passing through one pair of holes. And you'll see that when I take it apart. What this is sometimes interesting for, these extra tunnels, is I like a garment just to, to flow and to do its own thing. But potentially, you could, if you were to put your arm through this, 
Perhaps this could, sorry, this could be incorporated into a sleeve. If you bend your arm, you're able to bend your arm. Yeah, perhaps you are. Just turn sideways on that. Perhaps these tunnels on the outside could become sleeves. It's potentially possible. So then, once you've made a shape, you can then drape it, you can fit it, you can make it the shape that you want it to be. But it's, it sometimes takes some secondary work if you want to play around with it a little bit more. If we just come over here just a tiny bit more. So if I just remove that from here for a second, and then I drop it down here. Another thing about it is it's got a point here, and where's, there should be another one somewhere else. Over here. It's got two points, and so the points suggest, if it's got two angled points like this, it suggests that maybe this thing might be maybe rectangular or square, the original shape. We'll see when we sort of go through the construction process of deconstructing it, of dissecting it apart. To do that, I'm just going to put a couple of little simple balance marks on it. So on the front seam here, which I'm going to split, I'm going to just put a, a line across there and call it A to A. And if you turn to the back, on this second hole here, which is the one the body's not going through, we'll do that in red because it's black and white, I'll call that one... B to B. So I've just made some little, um, the only reason for doing this is that when I take it apart, it allows you to sort of understand how different points come back together again. The first seam I'm going to cut apart, I think, is going to be what's called the side seam. This has a side seam. The side seam often starts under an arm, or depends where, for a top anyway, starts under an arm and it ends at the hem. But this particular seam, it goes down here and it doesn't actually end anywhere, it just ends in the middle of nowhere. So it just seems to maybe double back on itself, so that perhaps suggests a loop of some kind. On this side, it's a longer one. It starts here and it continues until this point over here. So it's a longer version on this side. So that means it's asymmetrical, but also another loop. So I'll take one of these apart first of all, so we can just have a look at it. I'll do the shorter one first. So when I do this, don't uh, feel too much. I'm not going to hurt you in any way. Um, but it is going to... So, if you turn sideways this way, you begin to see that there is a hole that the body started on the front and the body is actually passing through a circle here, which is just going a little bump slightly. And this is a looping, <coughs> is a loop here. If you then turn that way, I'll undo the other one. longer one. So that too loops around. And now we have exovision. We can see into the garment. We can see that the body is passing through a hole that started in the front and has gone onto the back and because of gravity falls downwards. So the body's passing through it. You see there's a little turn around that way. And then to the front. I'm going to keep spinning you around. <laughs> So, the next thing I'm going to do is take, I think, apart this, uh, no, I'll take apart the hole at the other back, because the body's not passing through, just so you can see what happens here. Now this is two circles, two circular holes. I just ripped it on the wrong way. I quite like the fact that at some point I'm going to mend all of this with some gooey hand stitch back together and darns. So what we have here, before I just sort of slightly ripped it off grain there, is we have a circular hole. And that hole was constructed to be big enough for the body to pass through. And it's, uh, these holes, this hole here is circular and it connects to another hole over here. So these two were just joined a second ago before I cut them apart, and now they've been released. Two separate holes from each other. Turning back towards the front, we're gonna do the hole that you're actually passing through. Turn around that way. 
this is actually this is cool. This is the last hole that I'll be taking apart. And with this one, by releasing that, just turn back to the front for a second, it means that this drops down suddenly. I don't know whether you're able to step out of that carefully. Trick on it, lovely. So now we have this hole, which is big enough for the body, the hips to pass through. It was a measurement that was a nice, easy hip measurement connecting to this one here. And the body was going through that a minute ago, tunneling through it. We just give a little just twist around so you can just see what's happening on all sides here. It is quite a complex shape, obviously, when it's looking like this. But is it really complex? I don't think it's really that complex when you're actually going to see what it is really made from. I'm just going to um, release the shoulders so that we can uh, take it off the body and see as a flat uh, piece. By the way, um, I actually made this pattern from scratch step by step, but there was no flat pattern for it until now. This is the first time I'm going to see the flat pattern, so until this point, the pattern has really existed only in my memory and also in my actions, in my movements of my body, when I'm actually drawing lines, because I draw them not with rulers, but by a hand. And so my physicality gets involved in the pattern, and I'm now going to see where it was I made holes, joined them together, and created certain lines. And it will be an interesting thing to see for the first time. So much. And having good balance as well. If you can hold uh, that end and that end, like that, and I'm going to hold this end up here. So it had two corners, if you remember. So it is actually just a rectangle, if you see it this side. It's a rectangle that's made from a cream material. It's about three metres long. I don't actually measure three metres. I just measure one arm length, two arm length, three arm length. That's my three metres. But this is three, about three metres long uh, in cream. And then on the other side, a, a contrast material, stripe. The only reason I choose these materials when I'm prototyping is that when people prototype, they often work in this material here when they're making garments. It's called calico or muslin. And it's very, very industry-wide and in education used a lot to prototype garments in. But this garment, is, this material is very unlike any material we might actually wear. It creases a lot. It's kind of, um, it's not a very forgiving fabric in that it, it remembers all its creases and it shrinks very easily. What I love about it, it's got a lovely smell of hay when you uh, iron it. But other than that, it's, it's not a very good prototyping material. And yet, there are plenty of waste materials around the world from market stalls and, and warehouses that sell end of line fabrics where you can buy fabrics much cheaper than calico because calico is actually fairly expensive. Um, to prototyping. So I like to work in bed sheeting and other kind of materials that are softer, more fluid, because they're more like the end garment that might be being made, which in this example is a dress. So always choose the prototyping material that better suits the end product. Don't just use it because that's what we're supposed to do in education or in industry. That's a kind of a, uh, just a convention is, is an unnecessary part of the making process. So I'm now going to just give this end to you and split it open this, so we can lay it completely flat, and that way I'll be able to actually stand in it and sort of walk around it a little bit more. A bit more like an environment, as if it was an architectural piece. The longest one of these garments I've ever made is 32 metres long. And 32 metres is quite a large space, and if you're measuring or making a garment that's 32 metres long, which is like from that wall to that wall and back again and then a bit more, you don't want to be measuring using centimetres or inches because uh, it'll take you all day. You'll forget the number and have to start again. It's much better to use a number that's maybe a stride or a step, or maybe just a measure by eye, or use within a space. This has got squares. This is a beautiful measured space already that you could work, uh, use certain things like chairs or things in the space to measure by. And it's not an inaccurate way of measuring clothes. The more you get used to practicing it, you can become exceptionally accurate by measuring by eye or by measuring with a chair or a foot or a stride or a jump. People often think that um, the numbers and the tools are what make the process um, exact and uh, replicable. But um, you can also make your own. And you can also measure very, very accurately without them. Now we have a very large piece of material which we're going to lay on the floor. And I'm going to move. I'll leave this down there so you can sort of see it. Um, can you 
pull that corner out. So this geometry uses two, a sort of like a moving angle that goes between worm's eye view and bird's eye view. And it uses a front and a back, which these are just like sort of shape of patterns to get the necks right. This is just a prototype, so I get the neck in a certain shape I like. That's the front and that's the back. And then the seam, side seam's looped. And so I just simply draw a freehand line to loop those side seams together on that side. On this side to join these two together, and it's literally just done like <coughs> it's a human line. It's a it doesn't if you go up and down, it's more complicated than so. But why not? If you want to, you can move around that line and make it a little bit more uh, unusual. I'm just going to just um, take a quick picture of this pattern so I can see it. I don't think I've seen that scale. This is hole A, and that joins the hole A here. So these two have a relationship with a valley fold between it, and that was what I put my hand through in the first instance that came out the other side when I was talking about there being a pocket. That's actually where I put my hand through, just there. There's then two other holes that have a relationship with each other, here and here, and they join together too, but the body didn't pass through that one. It could have, but it could have better without it. This garment rises upwards from a bird's eye angle. A little bit like, this is just the top layer only. Here we have a back and a front, and the side seams have been looped together. You might loop them symmetrically, or you might put them onto different angles. In this example, they put onto different angles because that goes with the grain of the material. So they're both on bias grain lines. Not when material has warp threads and weft threads when it's woven, and if you put it onto a 45 degree angle of that, it stretches a bit more. Now we call that the bias grain line. Now this isn't bias perfect, it's bias-ish. So I never really measure it being 45 degrees. I just put it on the angle I think is about right. And it just gives it a little bit more flow when it's on the body. It stretches a little bit more and it's a bit more um, kinder to the figure it's hugging as it drifts down the body to the ground, it's gravity taking it downwards. With something like this, it works from an aerial viewpoint. And the first step of construction, once you've made this first hole, that's one hole made there, is you take the back and the front, and the garment rises upwards, like this. You close your shoulders, and then you close your side seams together, which is the loop side seams, and you end up with something very fitted, but also has lots of volume in the bottom. And that's what that was made from. That's the very, very first hole. It makes a very long tube. Now, how the holes connect to each other, a little bit like this. When you have a, when you have a tube that's very long, longer than the length of the body, a body might length, you know, end here, but you have more than the length of the body. I've got my back and my front, and they just fold together. You close your shoulders and you close the side seams. You turn often the seams onto the inside when you're making garments. Although I'm teaching kind of radical pattern cutting, I like my seams to be on the inside where they should be, but if people want to put them on the outside instead and expose the seams, they can. They can be a punk about it if they want. Um, that's totally up to them, but I like my seams to be inwards. <coughs> it's a garment that, from the front and the back, is just a very, very long tube, too long to be worn. So the first thing you do, so if I was going to subtract this, I would fold it once to the front, turn it over once to the back, turn it over once to the front, and it makes a zigzag like this what I call a concertina. And you'll notice that there are valley folds here and there, and then there's another one there. There's three valley folds. This, this term, valley fold, is a thing used in origami. A valley fold is when a book comes together. These other folds here are what are called mountain folds. So it looks like the peak of a mountain. I hate origami, but I just like the terminology that's used in it. Now, if I put a pair of folds big enough for the body to pass through, like we know, because we took it off the body, that, um, the body could go through this hole. Then if I put a hole above it, big enough to get through, and I use the valley fold as a mirror line for its pair on the other side, I can begin to pair holes together, which get sewn, like the one I stood through a minute ago. They can be sewn together, and that creates a route through a tube that is 
playing with the geometry of a shape like this. I folded this in a straight line, so it's not actually doing a very exciting shape. I'll show you what this looks like in a slightly larger version, just so I can get my hand to it. I have here a front and a back. It's been folded over. Close your shoulders, close your sides, and you have a tube too long to be worn. You then fold it once to the front, once to the back, and once to the front. The reason you go front, back, front, back, front, back is that it distributes the weight of the garment evenly and hangs on the body with more symmetry, with a, not symmetry, but more balance. So that the back doesn't weigh more than the front and doesn't drag the neckline. It creates a garment. When you join pairs of circles through a valley fold line, it joins together. So A sews to A, and then B sews to B, and then C to C. What happens is that the holes all vanish off the inside of the garment, and your body will pass through the hem and the bottom, through the first set, through the second set, through the third set, and out to the top. And you wouldn't see my hand or my body because they'd be joined together. And also, it's not fab the fabric isn't paper, it's, it's a textile that has drape. So it's going to collapse in a way that is quite unpredictable. When you see this as a garment pattern, though, it, you can see that it has two geometric viewing points. You can see it like a person standing up, which is what I call a worm's eye view. So it has a foot and a head. Or you can float above it like a bird from an aerial angle and see that the body is coming in through, in through here, through there, through there, through there, through there, through there, through there, and it's tunneling through the pattern. So it depends on which viewpoint you decide to look at this pattern from. Now to take this one step further, you make two fabrics. We've got stripy and we've got plain. So here's an example of stripy and plain. The back is stripy, the front is plain. Now, how you put fabrics together is up to you. Every fabric is different, but it could be transparent and opaque, it could be heavy and light, it could be stretchy and non-stretchy. Those dynamic properties will play out in the make of a garment in an unpredictable way. But it's through practice and then you gain the expertise of what those fabrics could potentially do. You have to try. You can't sit at the safety of the design board doing a pretty picture of a garment thinking, oh yeah, I know what it's going to end up looking like. You don't. You have to make it. It's only through making that you'll ever realise what might possibly happen. Particularly when you start to fold, instead of straight lines, you fold at angles. There's an angle, it's not an angle of 45 or 22 or 78, it's an angle of your choice. Everyone will do it differently. But back to front, back to front, we now fold at angles instead. It still makes a concertina, but one that is now beginning to spiral around the body. I don't know if you can see on here, but um, we have this way of orientating three-dimensional shapes, and we often give them names. And in, in fashion design, we often say, this is the front, this is the back. And the line in the, the very middle of this front, we call the centre front. The centre front line, where one left or right mirrors to the other side, and then the back, the centre back line. And these are mirroring lines of symmetry, which aren't really present in the body. Um, it's a bit like when we have a globe of the world, we have north, south, west, and east, east and west. Now we orientate countries and places according to these directions. We say people live in the east, people live in the north, and south. But of course, that only works on a flat map. It doesn't work on a three-dimensional object. Because if you travel north, eventually you will be traveling south. If you travel east, eventually you'll end up in the west. That's the way your three-dimensional object works. And it's the same with the body. We call things left, we call things right, we call things back and front. But now, when we fold at angles, we're actually spiraling around the body. So if you go towards the left, eventually you will end up in the right. It's the way that the body works as it's a three-dimensional object. It's not flat. So we need to sort of like um, evolve our process of understanding that when it comes to three-dimensional, when it comes to a pattern. If we have a um, valley fold line, they will be folded at angles. So I have a hole here that mirrors across to its pair on the other side of the valley here. Here, and then there'll be one here to here. I'll show you a bigger version so you can see. All of these are angles to each other, they're not in straight lines, the way these circle the pairs are joined together. And that has the effect of really changing the shape of the body 360 degrees around it. We have a stripy front and a plain back. We make it into a tube by closing the shoulders and the side seam, so now it's too long to be worn. We fold it at an angle once, twice, and this time three times. If it was 32 meters long, you keep folding, keep folding, keep folding. 
every time you fold, it gets shorter. Every time you subtract pairs of holes, it gets lighter in weight. So you control the weight and the volume and the shape in time through practice by the removal of space. And that removal of space gives you room to be within, but also change the outer geometry. A sews to A, B sews to B, C sews to C. Now when you start folding at angles, weird things happen because the back, which is plain, ends up on the front, which is striping. And the front, which is striping, ends up on the back, which is plain. And if you follow the side seam, this is the right side seam, it zigzags and ends up on the left. And the right ends up on, on the left, ends up on the right. So what's happening is back is on the front, front is on the back, left is on the right, right is on the left. And the only reason for that is because it's going around the body this way. As a world is very east and end up in the west, same if you go left, you end up right. If you go front, you end up back. We're working around the body, and that's throwing the material around in a very unpredictable way. For our brains, we can't figure it out on paper beforehand. We have to make it in material. Through making, we learn, we understand. So A connects to A, B connects to B across diagonal value fold lines. And through cutting one hole for the head and neck, two, three, four, five holes in this dress. But I call this dress a six hole dress. <coughs> Can anyone imagine where the sixth hole is? So they will think, where's the sixth hole of this particular garment? I've got one here, two, three, four, five, and it actually has got six holes in it. Okay. Thoughts? The hem, are you saying? The hem. The hem, of course, is a hole, because those of you were going to get into it. So it starts with a hole, but of course that's on a different geometric plane. It's not so, with these holes, we see them from above. With that hole, we see it from a uh, worm's eye view. So it's twisting geometries here as you pass, we come in through there, through that hole, through that hole, through here, and then it rises upwards. And these holes just simply pull the fabric inwards. And that's what created the shape, simple as, six hole dress. And this tube can be used to make any kind of garment uh, shape. It could be made to make a dress, as it is here. I use dresses as a starting point just because it's a nice, fast and easy, quick garment to make. But you could use the same thing, say, for a leg of a trouser or a, um, I might just stick a trouser leg on here so you can just see it. I have this thing called crazy legs, and crazy legs is a way of making very, very extreme and unusual trousers. And it's based upon this idea that, of dynamic movement. If I work with, say, a company like Nike, then we will make much, much more dynamic shoes, such as these, which are made for um, a, the leg to go through. I can't get my boot through it, so it would be a bit, um, I'll put it on an arm instead. In the same way that a sleeve became a trouser leg when Thibaut did it, it works the other way around too. I often make trousers and end up turning them into tops because they're very interesting for both. Sometimes I put my head through and turn them into collars. So I, I, I don't like to think that the thing is a particular thing until I've gone through a long process of making, examining, watching it, looking at it and seeing what it might be. But this is a potential trouser leg that's made from a kind of a carrot-shaped tube that is narrow at one end and wider at the other end. So this end, I can get a leg through. That end down there, I know I can only get an ankle through or a wrist and a bicep. And uh, on a leg, it's going to look kind of quite dynamic in shape. I'll show you some pictures of it in a bit. And that dynamism is part of its movement when it's running, because we know we, we stretch and we move. I also quite like making trousers that are not for dynamic movement, but perhaps are for just walking really slowly. You know? And um, because a lot of the time, we're not doing dynamic sports stuff. We are just sort of hanging out and doing um, sort of more comfy, leisurely things. So. Sometimes you might want to make a snail trouser, for example, which I'll show a picture in a minute, which is just for walking very slowly in and has extra fabric that doesn't need to be dynamic. These tubes, if I was going to be teaching it, I would start with a tube that is the same one end as the other. It's about 70 centimetres all the way around this end, it's 70 centimetres around that end, and it's double the length of whatever we're making. So it's about, if I have to fold it in half, it's double the length of a leg. If I was doing an arm, I'd do double length of an arm. If I was making it, because sometimes I teach it to architects who make buildings in soft structured shapes, then maybe the hole, the space, is big enough for whatever activity is taking place within that space. Is, is it a 10-man tent? Is it a lounge? Is it, what is the building's you know, potential shape? Or, um, so these things can always be scaled up and down according to what it is that it's covering or uh, containing. 
So it's big enough to get your legs through, and it's double the length for it. And what I would do is I just start to fold it, like say, fold it that way, that way, and that way, as an example. I, and then I put pairs of holes with a circle big enough to get your legs through between here and here, and between here and here. And I'd make a series of these um, tubes up. I'd never just rely on one idea. I'd always want to try different ways of folding, and you'd eventually end up with potential leg shapes. This has three pairs of holes in it that look something like this. Now, this might be a sleeve, or I could perhaps stick my head through it, and it could be some sort of weird collar or sort of um, cowl, um, or maybe something for the leg. But I put it on the leg, and because it's, the tube is the same either end, I can put it on this way up, or I can turn it upside down, and I can put it on that way. And I can rotate it so this is the front, or I can turn it and say, no, that is the front. So it doesn't have a front or a back, and it doesn't have a top or a bottom. It's a disorientated shape. But by being disorientated, it allows me to think and design and to imagine different possibilities of what it could potentially be used for. And I'd make a series of them up. i then get a one piece, because there's only one seam in this particular tube, that joined it before I then joined up all the circles. I then make a one piece pair of trousers, something like this. This is the one I showed you initially, which has just one seam in it down there. And I then make up a little tiny mini pair of trousers, like this. When I put that on a bit on a person, and I get the fit of the crotch right and make it absolutely perfect, and it fits up top, and then I'd slot this tube into this tube so that because they're both tubes, they can be put within each other, and then I would find a way to pin them together around the body at exactly the right, you know, <coughs> area that works with the leg. I'll show you some of these pictures when I turn the lights down a bit so you can see. So we get the fit of it absolutely right in the body that is working with the movement that's being made. Because they've both got just one seam in the top and one seam in the bottom, I'm able to cut through that seam and to lay it as a flat pattern. And when I lay it as a flat pattern, I can then make a secondary prototype, the next stage, where I get rid of this seam between top and bottom, and it becomes a one-piece pattern instead. So that it resembles, if you put left and right together, it might instead resemble something like this. So it's, it's sometimes working through stages with a very simple idea, a tube, that is very playfully folded, and then fitted on the body or the arm or wherever it might be, and then we join it onto another garment type, which is, I, I then make sure this is all looking good on the body, I do a fly, I do pocket shapes, all the things you'd normally do making a garment function, um, it then becomes closer to making a real garment. I'll show you what this actually became in a minute. Um, sometimes when I'm prototyping, rather than using this plain material that's very, very common for calico, which is not the best fabric always for prototyping, I like to use stripes. With stripes, you can see the grain line. You can see the dynamism of the shape, because the lines tell you that, and so it's very useful. And so it's often useful to start using other prototyping materials that are actually giving you better feedback. And that's why I like to use stripes in this example too, not just because it does my eyes in and um, creates, creates stroboscopic effects, but because it's actually interesting to see where the grey lines end up being. I call it crazy legs as a way of making garments because I show it quite a lot in, you know, so I teach often in China and in Hong Kong. And it's about dynamic making that um, sometimes these patterns don't need to be made from measured ruled lines, that perhaps they can be made from just human lines. And maybe if you draw a human line, then um, that's come from you, the cutter, the maker. There's a humanity in that curve and in the, in, in the measuring that you've done by eye. And that is very like, that humanity, those, that sort of curviness is very much like the um, shapes that were making the garment form, which is a human being. So sometimes I make patterns by simply putting a piece of fabric down and just drawing with a paintbrush instead. You know, often when we learn pattern cutting, we use these tools and we use two-inch pencils. We're very hunched up over our patterns and it makes us quite stressful in the making of those lines and measurements. But if you use a liquid medium instead, like an ink or paint, it's much more fluid. And, um, there's a distance between you and the work. You just you know, tape a paintbrush to a meter ruler and just paint. And it's kind of, it's quite intriguing to make a shape like that and to see what happens. In this example, I'm making a very a quick freehand tube that was made for a leg, but I realized it wasn't quite wide enough to fit a leg, so I added a bit of stripe in. So it was a mistake. By adding a stripe in, I was then able to fit it into a trouser. Here's the seam between the top and the bottom. There's a seam in there, but I obliterate that seam when I cut the pattern apart, like this, 
laying on its side, it becomes a one-piece pattern. And then in the second prototype, it's much more pure and more able to sort of work on the fit of it, the pockets, and all the things that necessarily make it a trouser. So I think there's an evolution of developing patterns that doesn't all happen in the, the very first one. When I teach it to people, they don't know, am I making a textile design here, or am I making a garment pattern design? Uh, or is this a painting, or is this a pattern? And actually, I don't really see any differences between these things, which is why, as a cross-disciplinary group, I don't see differences between these subjects that we put students into, or that we, in industry, we say this is this and that is that. Because actually, I think there's lots of grey areas between them, and methodologies of working that can be shared. And so, I don't see pattern painting as being any different from uh, normal pattern construction. It just has come out with something fluid instead that is very quick and um, expressive and kind of messy. And therefore, you don't control it in the same way. By being uncontrolled, it, you have to accept the accidents that happen and the risks you take. And uh, often, therefore, it shows you something that you would never have imagined if you were being very, very controlled at every step and trying to figure out and know what the design is. Let the design come to you. Let, it, let the fabric teach you what it wants to do, what it wants to make. And that's why, at the moment, I, I work not with fashion designers in my day job. My sort of anchor job that keeps me in one place is working with MA students at the Royal College of Art in London. And I work with textile designers there, not fashion designers. And they build garment shapes out of their fabric. So we grow the textile process, the weave, the knit, the embroidery, into the shape of the garment. So there's a relationship between them. It's not just something that's plonked on top of a uh, design and cut out. It's something that's the two are sort of working together. And for me, there's a, it's very important to let the material tell you what it wants to make and let there be a connection between the two things. It's kind of why I don't believe that robots will enter into the equation of garment making too soon, because unlike, say, in the car industry or in uh, certain products that are put together from, from uh, rigid materials, they can be assembled by machines and by robots. And there is a movement to... Um, uh, there are sort of uh, tests being done to um, have robotic systems that were used in car design to, first of all, we harden the fabric, we make it rigid like cardboard, and then the machine picks it up and sews it on a sewing machine, and then afterwards the fabric is soaked in the liquid to make it not hard anymore, and then we have a garment. But this kind of only really works for t-shirts, jeans, rigid type materials and shapes. It doesn't work with anything that's fluid or twisted or has that kind of um, softer geometry because for that you really need a much more innate human hand-connected approach to the garden, to making the product um, where the material leads. The material tells you what it wants to do and how it wants to be handled and constructed. And it comes from uh, an understanding of that upwards um, to find the, what the actual design could potentially be. I hope that makes sense. I'll just show you one little thing before I show up or invite some questions. Or I know some of you have to um, do something for occasion or go at some point. But I just thought I'd, when, at the moment I'm running a project. Um, if I didn't have my one day a week job at the RCA, then I would um, be able to travel and, travel and travel and travel and travel around the world. Um, but the RCA is my anchor for 10 years. Of, keeping me in one place where I always have to return from wherever I go to do my one day a week at the Royal College. And um, at the moment, for this term, I'm running a project called Prototype. Prototype Toile, and it, but it's not made for fashion students, it's made for textile designers, or in fact anyone who works in materials. We make furniture, we make um, designs for interiors, we make products, we make measures, rulers, uh, art products, but we also sometimes make garments. And, it's a very interesting project because it doesn't just relate to fashion design in any strict sense. And the reason I'm really teaching it to textile designers in this way is that I only have one day a week with them. And you cannot teach a group of 20 students how to pattern cut a garment in that time. It's, it's just not possible because you have to learn all the conventions of garment making. And if you're not able to do that, let's find another way. So take, working from the sort of, sort of starting point, if you can peel an orange, you can make a garment. If you can deconstruct anything that's three dimensional, then you end up in a flat pattern. And then from that flat pattern, you can start to evolve it into a shape. These were designs by somebody called Shikihishi Numa, who really inspired me when I was studying here at the Royal College. These large wind sculptures that were actually made from very simple geometric, triangular, and angular shapes, which I find very interesting. 
Uh, subtraction cutting has been used by architects, like this is a person called Gavin Schilling, who's um, a professor at a college in uh, Dusseldorf, who is using it in, 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 uh, in an architectural uh, setting instead, which I find very intriguing. Mapping, flattening out. This is just a little slideshow that I show the students to get them thinking about how you could possibly make shape. So with Christo and Jean-Claude, who just wrap shapes, this idea that you can just wrap, 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 wrap. That's a lovely starting point for making something. If it's little, why not start from that? And then perhaps we scale it up on the you know, five, ten times to see what it then happens if we do it on a garment body scale. The purpose of the project I do with the RCA students is to try and find a real connection between the body and the textiles. And for that, we need to actually know whose body. You know, who are we actually talking about here? And this is a real body, not just a mannequin dummy. People often talk about the body in fashion, but they never, or very infrequently, they get you confront it and use it. Perhaps they do it at the twirling stage at some point, and then later on they have some models who glamorously wear it down the catwalk. But until that point, garments aren't actually you know, developed on a human body. And yet the human body teaches you so much when you begin to involve it and to have it working with you and learning from it and measuring from it. So I've ever had some amazing uh, fine artists who uh, use their own body and their own reach to create shapes which so, could so easily become garment designs. Carolyn Broder, deconstructed garments with just the seams are left so the garment sort of just um, you know, sort of collapses. Uh, Genevieve Sevendur, very interesting maker. There's a guy called Ricard Levinquist who worked with um, her and made some fantastic one-piece shapes and he uses his own body in performance. He dresses in a black body stocking so that he becomes a kind of a non-person, a stick figure, and creates garments around himself and he does this in performance. And I love this idea that um, designers can perform their patterns, can, they're physically active in making it. And so, um, he's got a fantastic company called Atakak, based in Sweden, that they share, they're not, not only do they make garments to sell, but they also share their patterns online digitally for anyone who wants to try them out and use them. Of course, if you wrap a, a piano or a helicopter, you can then use the shape uh, to make a garment that will be somewhere between a piano and a person, once it's because that's what soft materials do, they collapse. I'm only showing you this just really because it's a sort of um, recent work that is just inspirational stuff to think about. That, like the caddis fly, for example, creates an environment around itself. So if you put, usually it's shells and bits of debris that lay at the bottom of the water in the rivers that it lives in. But there's an artist, uh, Hubert de Pratt, a jeweler, who puts gold and semi-precious jewels so that the actual caddis fly creates the jewelry. And it's actually a collaborative collaboration between the caddis fly and the jeweler. And I love this idea that you use things around you and you create the space around yourself. Plenty of waste materials in the world to turn to and to uh, try to use, of course. And also the space sometimes between people. If we're making garments, we don't always have to make them for singular people. We can begin to think about shared spaces. I was doing a project with uh, interior designers at the RCA who were making um, garments for refugees that would transform into shelters. And so this was a very interesting project because we were trying to save people's lives and um, maybe, a, a, maybe a shelter can be made from five garments as a community piece. We come together and we use different aspects of the garment to join to make something that people can be, uh, you know, can live in, that can protect them from certain elements. And Lucy Waters is an artist who's worked very much in that area and I find it very intriguing. I always get, if I ever do workshops with people, I get them to make a garment and then we do messy drawings that are. Uh, we look at the garment and we draw it in a very messy way. We paint it ob in observation. And the reason I get people to do it quick and messily, you, often with paint, is that it's, it, it's like a, a um, loosening up of their limbs. If you do a fast thing where you haven't involved, you haven't sort of invested too much care or attention and you're not using rulers, then there's no stress in that line. It's very much a human line. And, um, then when you go to make a garment pattern, having done a bit of messy painting, that messiness, that humanity continues into the pattern. So it dis it's a disruptive thing. So I like to use sometimes painting and drawing as a disruptive process to make then garment cutting a little bit looser. Much like you do if you do any sport, you do a warm up exercise to get the limbs stretched out before you actually do whatever exercise it is that you're planning to. You always warm up first. And 
particularly, I think painting is a great way of disrupting pattern cutting. In quite some mathematical shapes. The um, Holly McQuillan, who invited us to um, uh, New Zealand, here she makes a garment pattern called Worn Peace. And it uses typography, there's words within it. And I said it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, there's no gaps between it. So this is a zero waste pattern that then makes these two garments. It was for an exhibition. And it has, you know, it's making use of words, of ideas, but also no material waste between it. But also when she evolves these patterns, she doesn't know exactly what's going to become until she's experimented and trial and error and prototyped it. So it's not like she has to figure out everything on the design board. It's through the process of making which we often work out these ideas and find a use for these. Subtraction cutting. If you want to learn more, there's plenty more techniques that aren't being shown here that you could uh, have a go at if you want to. I teach you to knit designs because with knit designers, when you instead of cutting a hole, you can construct the hole as a um, as almost like a lace hole, a piece of space within the shape that you can actually create holes for buttonholes. You make a buttonhole, and then you can make a hole for a person to go through. So instead of actually subtracting, there's no material waste when it comes to knitwear. It can be constructed instead, I think. And that is very sort of intriguing uh, from a uh, point of view of not wasting. And here on another side of it, there's a guy called Leonardo Hidalgo. He actually weaves the fabric, but these are what are called the, um, the weft threads, and these threads are across the warp threads. So he creates spaces where there are no threads so that the holes connect and there's no material waste. But he does it working with uh, more indigenous um, local craftspeople who create the fiber, who naturally dye it, who weave it. There's a time process and it all evolves over time. So it's a very beautiful thing to see somebody else taking subtraction cutting in a very, very different direction. This is me trying out different tube shapes on the leg. Before I decide on anything, I just I'd make a lot of them, see it observe it, photograph it, see which one works best, and then I will go and fit it and make it and construct it into a finished thing. So we're working with uh, Jimmy Watanabe or Owen's Lodge. That's it, don't worry. Of course, this is inspiration to textile students, so it's about them trying to then take their methodologies of making and to find a connection between their knitting, their weaving, their embroidery and these shapes that they're potentially making for garments. That's the end. <laughs>